Good to go. Thank you. Uh, this will end probably around 1145. Um, I think was the plan. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, if, if you're splitting an hour, it's still uh, yeah, fifty two. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Is on quad J says um so if you're fifty fifty then yeah, I can yeah, do that. I think we have some guys. Uh,
So I think So the body of the trailer is like It, there's a lot of songs.
um, texting. Bobbing out by <laughs> him. You're on. Eleven. Sorry, all the speaker is on his way. Uh, he'll be here in probably two minutes. We uh, this this uh, slot is um, goes through 1215, but we shouldn't need that much time. We'll see. Make it out early, get you guys to lunch. Robert, I was told. <laughs> I was told this was supposed to start at eleven thirty. Gina. Oh. <laughs> My heart rate's like it's, a, it's eighty. It's so kind of bad. Your clicker, no. sir. Allow myself to introduce yourself. Oh. Um, well, welcome everyone. This is the only gas track. Um, this is uh, that report is BS part two uh, below satisfactory. Robert Hargrave will be the presenter. Uh, this will focus more on what we see in stack test reports where FTIR analysis is used and it's primarily related to uh, compressor engine testing stationary rice. Uh, this would also cover turbines and generators uh, as well. So um, Robert Hargrave is a managing partner and the COO of Bayer. Uh, Robert's been in the industry for 20 years. Um, he's been at Bayer since 2009, and he's sort of a, a jack of all trades uh, in the company. He graduated from the University of Oklahoma with a uh, degree in energy management, and you doubled in energy management, MIS. Yeah, so uh, Robert has been very instrumental in building out the uh, report templates that we use at Bear, and, uh, and so he knows this uh, this information very well and knows what what to look for in stack test reports and um, so with that I give you Robert Hargrave the third first of all I just want to say uh, my apologies for being slightly late was not my fault um, another thing that I was going to point out and Randy's the one that put all these slides together. I'm not really quite sure they were expecting. Um, I said, hey, we should use one of our own reports and say the report, but it's okay. This is one of our own reports. <laughs> it's just a cover page, and I pulled the logo off. I, but, but still, nevertheless, this is a fantastic uh, style of report that we came up with. Um, as Randy mentioned, we're going to be going through talking about uh, just the various portions of FTR analysis using the D6 to the 48, which is the primary method used. Uh, for FTR analysis, it's just um, it doesn't read very well. As in, if you're going through the, the mm -hmm. method, it can be quite confusing. But with some help from some experts and a lot of training, then you know, able to uh, be sure that we're getting all the data quality checked with um, method. So we're going to start off for first with, with the recipe. Then we're going to move on to the outside field analysis, um, and we're going to go through as well as some some um, common issues. Uh, the first thing we're going to look at here is on various annexes. <clears throat> the FTIR uh, 60 to 48 method, or the ASM 60 to 48 method, requires every one of these um, annexes to be done. And it goes anywhere from 
the field spread up to the very end post uh, test manual validation. We're going to go through each one of these uh, throughout this presentation. But it's really important just to note that if you do half of these, one of these, three of these, it, it, you're not going to win. So the, the gist of this presentation is going to be what is a solid FTIR test? What does it really look like? What data quality objective really needs to be met? And how is that done? And how is it reflected within? Uh, we're talking here about the Annex 3, this is the record spectra. Um, this is typically what you get from the manufacturer. We get it from um, NKS, they build the spectra for us. And it's it's essentially, um, can have it set up for different types of combustion sources. So if you're doing natural gas uh, combustion recipe, um, that's typically what we use because 99% of the stuff that we do is natural gas combustion, combustion sources, thermal oxidizers, engines, turbines, things of that nature. Um, and then also the um, Annex 7 is also prepared um, to add the algorithm that's used to actually quantify the results within the FTIR. Uh, right here, are you going to get the candy? Are you going to hand it out? Uh, I change for y'all since he can't play. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with this presentation. It seems like it's mildly out of control, um, but it's okay because this is not my first rodeo, so I was about to. Um, so, so, so the, the, the first portion right here is, is the annex was the test plan. It's like, okay, what are we doing? What kind of sources are we testing? What kind of combustion are we going to be looking at? Uh, what type of run situation are we in the three 20 minute runs, three one hour runs, et cetera. Uh, and that is um, typically determined based upon the sources requirements based off of whatever the regulatory guide. Uh, then the pre-test prep is the NX is four through six. And I think we're gonna get to that here in a second. Um, NX four, this is the this is something that has to be done on a daily basis. This is where you get the, the background, which is essentially residual noise within the instrument. So you'll be pulling in zero nitrogen through, and typically you'll get to near zero with the nitrogen flowing, but you'll see some residual um, quantities of, of propane, CNO, NOx, things like that. And at that point, you hit the background button and it actually zeroes everything out, so you can start from square one. And it's really important to do that because before you run your gases through the calibration procedure, you need to know what the absolute zero is for the conditions for the daily test. <clears throat> so then, as part of that, we take a look at the single beam right here. And this is a really important one because it shows the linearity of the analyzer. An interesting thing about the FTIR versus other types of analytical equipment, um, like we'll say like a um, oxygen analyzer, paramagnetic analyzer for, for oxygen uh, calibration, uh, you have to do a three-point calibration to show that it's linear. But the way the FTIR works is if you just do this single beam check with your plus or minus 0 0.005 um, inverse centimeters at 250, what that shows is in fact linear. And if it's not linear, there's things you can do in the field to reanalyze it. But the way that the FTIR works is if you have a gas that hits at, we'll say you're running a calibration gas at 250 ppm, if it hits at 250, that means you're good from zero to oh, essentially infinity. It is linear <coughs> Excuse me. Scaling max intensity. This this one's um, the rule of thumb on this. Let's put my hands on the screen. Uh, is you might personally at, at Bear as a company, our, our, our policy says above. We want to be above that one right there. Um, but the way the method reads, is you just have to make sure that it's above your previous um, reference spectra. So if you're at least half of the pre previous reference spectra is good to go. But this shows you how much uh, laser is actually getting through the analyzer. So you can say if you have a really low number, that means that there's something blocking the flow from the laser because the laser comes in from the back of the analyzer, and it bounces back and forth across these gold-plated mirrors, 5.1 meters inside this little tiny box, and it shoots out through a potassium bromide or um, zinc selenium windows. And that's basically saying that's how much light is coming through. So is this good? It's, if it's high like this, 
yes, plenty of lights coming through, so that FTA is getting a lot of infrared light coming through. Which is a very important check to do because if you're not getting anything, if you're getting nothing out of this, then you see the problem. Water peak analysis. This is where we're seeing the resolution of the instrument. And what we're trying to do here is make sure that the resolution is below that 0.5 um, fold half height in inverse centimeters. And, and the reason that's important, that says, so the first picture that we saw was we were showing the, the max intensity, like, okay, how much light's coming through? And this is saying, how good is the picture of what we're getting? And that's really important because we're trying to look at analysts in the PPD or less range. If you don't have a good picture of what's coming through, then how good is the data really? Slide. Okay. This is showing the um, the full tap. Light. This is showing that this is actually a very good solid um, resolution of this. This is also another thing that you need to be looking for is the calculated versus the original laser frequency. You, you do not want too much of a discrepancy between the both. Uh, and the thing about this particular analyzer, um, by comparison to other analyzers that we've used, is one, it's very repeatable. Um, it's very rugged and um, it's, it never fails. I mean, if something doesn't look right in your pre-checks, then there's something you can actually do to be able to fix it, but on a very rare occasion, does it need to change? Per the, uh, the, the uh, ASTM method, actually, it's not necessarily required to run all these calibration gases and doing all that stuff. It, it, we typically do do, we do that as overkill for the most part. But the most important thing, it's really a crazy uh, portion of this method in this analyzer. If you run this calibration transfer standard through your, your uh, gas analyzer, your FTIR analyzer, and it hits plus or minus 5% of the bottle, this is an F, this is an F lane calibration gas. If it runs through the bottle and it hits, that means everything's good. But if your, all your pre-checks look good, and your F and your F lane goes through, your CTS gas goes through, and it hits it's solid and hits plus or minus that 5%, then you're, it's, it's, it, everything else is going to hit period. But as a as a, at our standard practice, we still run through all the necessary calibrations. We'll also go through in a, here in a second about the spike recovery in that process as well. This is just a this is a screenshot from within our, our so we've got two reports the, the report template and the, the, the talked about that earlier, kind of the reporting process and data quality objectives that we reported to get set in the last class. This is something we developed on the back side to ensure that when our guys are actually using the FTIR, that they're going through these calibration procedures and they're doing the checks on the front side rather than getting it through the entire process and seeing an issue. So we built these templates that actually said, hey, you bring your calibration gas through. This is the this is the cylinder that uh, we actually, since the, since this template, we got into the expiration date of the cylinder because that's also useful information. Um, and this is just showing the, the direct response and the system response and then Portion to calibrate your response time um, for the method. So this is where we do the analyte calibrations for Annex 4. Um, and I think have, have they already rescinded the ability to use a C aldehyde? Or is that still on, on the uh, I don't know that it's been pushed through uh, and finalized yet, but you can use surrogates in, in certain situations with FTIR analysis. This example, acetaldehyde as a surrogate for formaldehyde for your calibration gases. Um, and we're also using surrogate protein for VOCs because if you're actually going to say I'm going to calibrate for every single component of a volatile organic compounds that relate to VOCs, it's quite onerous and costly. So you do that basically possible. Plus, there's no actually defined for the EPA what is contained within the VOCs per FTIR. So we do the same exact procedure that we did the CTS and your direct calibrations and your system calibrations, get your response time, do all that kind of stuff. And then at the very end, and this is a very interesting thing about this method versus any of the other reference methods for cal calibrations, you don't go through post-system calibration. All the other methods for NOx, for CO, for OZU, um, even for like an FID, do post-system calibration. But for the FTIR, for some strange reason, reason it states you do post direct calibration, which is fine. But the thing is, what do you? So we also do post oxygen calibration, so you get that check the system. But if you're just doing FTIR only, 
you don't know if, it, if you've got a hole in your seat between the sample line, you don't know if you're actually getting stack sampling, you have no idea what's really happening because if you're just doing the post direct, you're just checking is the analyzer actually looking still good? And the, and the answer is this FTIR, this, the, the MKS 2030 solid analyzer, it's going to look good every single day unless you suck in a big slug of water or something that'll muck everything up. But we, don't, we try not to do that. This is a screenshot of, of the, the calibrations, the, the CO, the NOx, so the CO, the NO, the propane. And another interesting uh, thing to mention is, you know, you don't have to calibrate for NO2 because it's all linear. Also, you know, we calibrate for propane as that surrogate, and it, that calibrates for all organics. So crude ethane, crude ethane, butane. Um, so once you get the, the propane number hits, which it will because the CTS already hit. So once that hits, then you're just verifying that in fact that they all the analyzers and all the analytics are um, coming in as they should. Am I tracking on time or am I too slow or too fast? No, you're good. Um, this is just the system calibrations of the, of the same analyzer. MDC, the minimum detectable concentration. This is a kind of a big one. Um, something that we've seen um, as a service, uh, our company provides third party report um, audits. To just say, okay, what does the method say? What is this report showing? What um, are the regulatory requirements? What is the report showing? And we go through step by step, method by method, their entire test report or test reports, and we walk through um, from A to Z, critical to grade within the report and say what's good, what's bad, what's ugly, and then we compare that with our report because the way that we generated and created everything is for uh, coherency and transparency because we don't want regulators saying where did this number come from how did this happen what's going on with this we said let's make this report um, something that anybody can look at and can tell the story of what happened with the stack test but along those same lines we've seen a couple um a couple groups that are not doing this minimum detectable concentration and this is something that is uh, required per annex two so if you're not doing this on a daily basis then you're but the way this works is you run in a calibration gas, which is the zero gas, run that through your system, and you have to collect eight samples at the same uh, recording time that you're doing your test. So take the quad here, you take any samples every minute, or whatever the, the, the sampling time is. So typically, you're taking the sample about every minute. So that means you have to do eight samples, running your oxygen, basically eight minutes. Eight to ten minutes. It's going to take some time for it to cool right into the gas cell, and then, um, and then after that, you take that zero and you make it the standard deviation of that. That's your minimum detectable concentration. That's important when, it's, especially if you're trying to uh, record something like a 350 ppb of like formaldehyde or something like that, because if your minimum detectable concentrations are above whatever uh, your regulatory requirement is, then it's actually not valid. Because we'll say if you're trying to record 350 ppb, but your uh, MDC is 2 ppm, then it's saying that anything below 2 ppm is not. So MDC is a very important thing to do, and it's very important for FCIR analysis. This is a, I think this is going to run it. This is an MDC screen. I think we did this over a couple different days. But it shows um, the process that running the gases through. And you can see that where the zeros are all hitting. And of course, there's some negatives at times. But this is showing a couple different days based off of those live numbers you can see that shaded. Um, but it just shows you the, the one major factor is the fact that your NBC is not going to be the same. Now. Statistically impossible to have the same NBC across different labs, same NBC in the same day. For the same lab, it's, it's just it's statistically impossible because you're looking at eight different recorded numbers based off of a different background from a different instrument or from the same instrument. So that background's going to change all your zeros. So you start saying, okay, what is this NDC going to look like? Is it going to be plus or minus zero? Yes. But the method doesn't say you're going to be plus or minus zero if you're NDC. The method says you're going to do this every single time. So it's one of the, it's a sticky point that a lot of people have missed. Um, can you, can you use a manufacturer spec? Oh, good point, Randy. No, you cannot use manufacturer specifications. Uh, the FTIR, the MKS 2030 has manufacturer specs that say that 
you can that it can analyze up to whatever detection level. That's not the same thing. You can't say, oh, I'm going to just say this analyzer can do this, or I have a brochure that says this is the zero that it can detect, because that's not how this works. So that's a good question. You cannot. This is another look at. It's the same data, just. Yeah, it's the same data, but it's in a tabular format. Just showing that as these indices are running through, they're close to zero, but they're not exactly the same. And this is the table, the tabular breakdown, just showing you on a daily basis from the 11th to the 14th. Your indices are close, but close does not count in special analysis. It just kind of shows another table showing the key uh, versus um, the previous. This is another thing that we've seen um, in some more third party report audits. It's the spike recovery. And spike recovery is a really, really important part of the FTIR uh, analysis and test method. And what it shows is adequate transport of your analytes of interest. So, why is a spike recovery important? Anyone? Because it shows adequate transport and analyze interest. There you go, you went back. Um, <laughs> so it's really important. This is important. So, like, so, so in particular, you have to have a tracer compound, which is SF6, because in standard combustion, SF6 is not part of standard combustion. If you're seeing SF6, significant amounts of SF6 in some sort of combustion process means you're burning something that shouldn't be being burned. So <laughs> you look at gaskets, you look at things like that because SF6 should not be inside. Large quantities of SF6 should not be inside your um, gasket. So what we're doing here is you have a known compound, SF6, with a known quantity, and you're spiking in any analytes of interest in the C-aldehyde, the NO, the you know, etc. And you have that mixed in so you can have a dilution ratio. And the other thing we've seen is this factor can't go over a 1 to 10 ratio. If it goes over the 1 to 10 ratio, if you get a 2 to 1, you get 20% recovery, er, you failed. Because if you're not following the method, then you're not following the method. And the other thing is that the, the, spike, the spike recovery is really easy to do if you're doing it the right way because it's only plus or minus 30%. So you get 70 to 130%. So if you look at with an engine that's swinging around or a turbine that's doing whatever, your spike recovery is going to come in just fine. The part of the spiking method. Works. Number of questions. <laughs> <laughs> so we're supposed to inject 50 to 150 percent of whatever the data is. Yes, this is also true. So what we do to combat that, uh, I'm hoping to put that in this slide. We have uh, the looters for all of our analyzers. We have large quantities, like our, our SS6 models are uh, running thousands. So we can just dilute down to whatever we need to. Well, the regulator relaxing and the infinite number of possibilities of dilution if you get a small data before. Wait, so what's your, what are you saying? So you guys, if you have one PPM coming out, you have to spike the That's going to be tough. Yeah, right. What, what has been the feedback from regulators when that is not So where do you, so my question to you is where are you having regulators that know anything about methods? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to teach them. No, I'm just asking the question. No, I mean, the, like, where are you operating? We have actually regulators asking about spike recoveries yeah. and actually knowing the, the requirements. Yeah, it's it's, it's been rare so like, that we encounter it. Yeah, it's so, been. So we primarily operate in the South Central region of the United States. So Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, uh, New Mexico, Louisiana, Arkansas, this kind of region. And I think we've seen some people on location actually in all the testing we've done in Arkansas this is the price from running toward office other than that we might get one or two visits a year and we do a lot of testing in these in these regions and, and the reality is uh regulators regulators are understaffed uh most of them are new and they're uh uninformed and speaking with the regulators I think for region four and TCQ which is the Dallas Fort Worth Metro uh, We've got two guys who look over the reports and look at about two percent of these because it's low. Price. What what has y'all's experience been, Josh? Yeah, 
they ask a lot of questions on the Scott Sinkers. They are understanding that how to meet that part of the spiking calibration. Yeah. If, if the concentrations are that low, yes, it's very difficult. It's also kind of like that low. Yeah. It's still yeah. showing adequate transport of the analytes of interest, which is the main point of this. And I think that for the most part, my experience with many regulators on site or otherwise, uh, it's just been, I don't know anything, can you teach me? So we just have a full on seminar pro bono, much provided. Um, and are, are you guys doing 320 or AST 6348? So the, the, the method is a little loose in its language. It, it, it does allow, um, you know, where it, it will say should be instead of must be. Um, so you, I would use that wiggle room as much as possible on, on something like, hey, your spike recovery needs to be um, within two times what the native concentration is, especially on uh, if I assume you're talking about formaldehyde measurements at, at that low of a concentration. I know we see CO that gets down pretty low with oxidation catalyst, but um, I, I think you've got some wiggle room there. We just did a test in uh, New Mexico with brand new um, uh, cattle in NSCR on Richburn, and I think it was the PSU. So they had these spike zero. <laughs> it's like, I don't know what yeah. you do about that. It's like 0.5. It's like, okay, so how are we going to do 0.5 and 0? It's like, you can't, I can't do it. And then CO is like 1. And then, like, the thing on Oxford is like 2. It's just like, nothing is going to end. It's awesome. Yeah, it's rich work. Yeah. That's and it's zero. Yeah. Um, this is just the screenshot showing that the SS, SF6 was being spiked in. You can see it kind of slowly, surely there's the SF6 coming in. And the bottle is probably 5 ppm in that SF6. So it's just showing that uh, we are, in fact, adequately transporting the analytes of interest. Percentages. Um, it's just an important thing to do. It has to be done, done outside. And it's the preferred way is to have calibration gases mixed, as in all your gases are in one bottle. Uh, but we've also seen uh, other situations where you've got different bottles, different concentrations, the bottle of SS6, and that just opens up a huge can of, of um, questions uh, and worms, as, as in what really happened here and how did you guys be able to gas it to be at the specific diluted rate or using mass flow controllers? What's really going on here? And you look throughout the reports and it's like saying that there's mass flow controllers are quickly listed. It's just it's kind of a, a kind of a thing that we've started saying, hey, be on the lookout for this because it's not in one model and just been thinking about that. As I mentioned, all the gases are blended in one bottle for that specific region, the Peru region, which is what we thought. Um, <coughs> again, yeah, with known concentrations, you can know exactly how much you're spiking in, and we've got tables and such that you build that will accurately the spike recovery. Um, manual validation, this is another one um, that per quad J, it says you have to report annex of 1 through 7, and we do a lot of quad J tests in our where we are operating, um, it's just everywhere. Um, and for um, the manual validation is omitted from the quad J language where it says 1 through 7, it doesn't say you don't perform all annexes, there's only four one through 7. And one of the issues that, that some people could say could be a problem with reporting the Annex 8 is that it actually is a manual validation. It's a manual quantification of your analytes, your target analytes, to make sure, hey, so when you run your gases through where you're sampling from um, engine or terminal source, it comes into the analyzer, and then the analyzer looks throughout the infrared spectrum, and it says, based off of this algorithm, based off of this region within the infrared spectrum, this CO is this PPM based off the algorithm. This is methane, methane, and it's all spread out throughout the entire infrared spectrum. And so, what we're doing when we go through and do the manual validation, is you actually, with your own human eyes, you have to go through the um, interference in a specific order to mitigate um, those interference. So, you pull the interference out and you say, how much am I really seeing of the CO? How much am I seeing of the anode or the butane or the propane? Or where the analytes are? 
Um, this is something that, that some people try to use as some sort of automated um, validation utility, I think, ABU software. It's not the same thing because it's automated. It's not, it's not. That ABU is really looking at a lot of those initial screen captures that you were talking about for your uh, resolution, linearity. Yeah. It's showing, it's showing instrument health, but some people are using the APU software screenshots as the manual validation. We've also seen some crazy stuff where people are, instead of doing the manual validation, like what we're about to show you on this specific time lapse, they're doing uh, like a post system CTS gas, which is not even required in the method, as I said before, you want to do direct calibration. They're doing a system. CTS gas, and you're like, I don't know what this is, but it's not a method lab. That's another thing you gotta look out for. So this is gonna show you, you go to the method analyzer, and then you load your spec, your, uh, your sample. And then you literally go compound by compound, and you just click and drag bars over here until you get to a deflection point. Stopping it? I think so. <laughs> so what's going on here? And so you take it down to the inflection point and actually showing you a really super peak. It's actually being registered within and you're cross comparing that. And you don't even have the numbers of what the little peak end is. It's you could, that's the cheat, the real cheat. Um, because once you become really accustomed to man uh, validations like this man quant, as they call it, it becomes second nature and you just go through it and show one by one by one. And it's, the other thing is you have to do this on a a, yes, a point that is close to the average and then an outlier higher up for each um, for each run. So you'd be at two points per run. But this just basically shows the whole process of this manual validation that a lot of people have overlooked. And this is what I said before, the, the APU software. A lot of people have overlooked that or have completely um, bypassed it and said it's not required. The fail rate on the manual validation. Zero. Oh, actually, one one time. So yes, there's been one time that actually CEO failed. So we had to do uh, some ticket fencing. We had an interference that was a part of the recipe. Can you guess the interference? You're not going to guess it. It's deadly. If you yeah. take it in capsule form. Yes. Oh my gosh. Cyanide. So I was testing this engine out in the, in the middle of nowhere in the panhandle, and it was swinging all over the place like a bad news. So the Richburg labor, so the options go at like zero to like five percent. It was on a control, and the uh, compression mechanic climbed up in like a top cylinder because there's nothing small in here. He climbs up there, he's running around on top of the engine like a bad man, and um, and it turns out that here the ticket two prices. That's such a good answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it. So, so, so literally, it's like, okay, he's going through the manual quant on the CO, and the CO is not quanting. He's like, what's going on here? There's something interfering with it. And at that point in time, we're using a third party to do a manual validation. So he looked at the data and he says, I think this might be cyanide. It's 40,000 ppm of cyanide. It could have killed me, but I did die, obviously, because I'm here. And I live to tell the story, but he called me and says, Oh my gosh, I'm so glad you're alive. I said, Why the flu? Had it, dude. Yeah, that, but he lived. And that, that was Marty Sparks so, that, 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 that did that, that yeah, that so did you that can tell validation. He, so it's yeah. like, Oh my gosh, you're not in the law. I mean, we'll try to do my presentation more like that next time. Uh, that um, okay, this is this goes back to. This is basically, this is like a synopsis of the entire presentation of, of what overlooked a lot of times. Like I said before, the NEA, which is also part of the NBC, not being done daily, um, not having your spike gases all in one bottle um, without any type of national controllers, things like that. And also people just not doing the manual validation or not understanding what they're doing. And that's one thing that's really important, especially if you're using a static testing provider to do for you to actually understand what they're doing, how it should be done, how it ties back to the regulations. This is a new addition to this, um, this particular presentation, the raw data logs. One of our favorite things to do when we do our third party report audits is to go through the raw data first before we get to the report. Because, uh, I mean, Randy and I have been doing this forever. Um, it's too long. 
years. <laughs> I've been doing this. I've been doing this for 14 years, I think. Um, and you know, just understanding the process, understanding the calibrations, understanding uh, the various test methods and the, and the requirements associated with those methods, and going through and doing it and training. I don't know how many people train. Tens of 20s, 30s, 50 people. I don't know. It's been a lot. Um, training and also do classes like this, and then having the opportunity to go through and get the first reports. Um, it's given us a really keen eye to just look at raw data, and we know what's required for each method. So if you're doing whatever type of a calibration, it does not matter what it is. You can look at the raw data and say, was it done correctly? Was it incorrectly? Did they miss something? And so, um, and as this says, it tells the story. I mean, if you look at the raw data, it will tell you good, bad, and indifferent of what really happened in the process. And I've seen some situations where they're saying they're doing some sort of calibration, but it's not in the raw data system. It's not in the raw data you do. Because the thing about every calibration that you do, every step that you take within the, the testing process and the method adherence, it takes time. Everybody knows time is money. So some people will say, hey, I'm going to cut this portion out. Don't record this. Then I can get done faster or get more tests and I get home with my dogs or kids or whatever. Um, but the reality is, if you're not following every step along the way, every single thing that is required, and at the end of it, is it really a valid test report? I would say no. Um, but also, I'm stick with the rules because I'm a nerd. And this just shows this is an example of our raw data that the uh, data acquisition, I can't talk, data acquisition software that we use allows us to go through and rename uh, different. Um, calibration procedures and such. And it just helps it helps the regulators, as I said before, transparency is the key for us. So we say let's make this um idiot proof the regulators. Not saying anybody's an idiot, but I'm saying you get idiot proof. Um, so we go through so it's a pre direct cows, which we for the FJIR, and then you have your MVC, which takes full 10 ish minutes. If I can add up, I'd say actually eight minutes. Uh, full eight minutes for the MDC as per required. I mean, when you're sampling at limited intervals, you've got to do eight minutes. You have to do eight plus. Maybe you can increase your scan time to every eight seconds and have a garbage load of data, but I don't think anybody wants to see that. Um, oh, and that was the end of my presentation. And I think I did okay on time. Um, does anyone have any questions, comments, concerns? So, you, sir. Point of interest. Um, the Quad J regulations, where it says to report annexes one through seven, one of the reasons that it um, it's believed that one of the reasons that they didn't say report annex eight is because when you go through that manual data validation, it does not generate a data log. You will not have anything that comes through a CSV file that can be converted into a, a data table. Um, so a, a recommended practice is to put a screen capture of your final numbers in your stack test report to show that that Annex 8 portion was done. So the, the time lapse, the screen capture that Rob showed of that entire process, we will put a, a, um, a screen capture from each of those data points. So two, two points per test run, as, as he mentioned, and that is a recommended practice that comes from EPA, from from the states, they they have said that's that's a, a good way to cover your basis there, uh, to show that the manual validation was done. And, and, and the, way we, the way we've done that is based off of uh, so we used to do work with Prism um, Analytical back in the olden days, and we learned a lot from Marty Sparks, who's one of the co um, designers of the AS twenty thirty. And he's still, and he was doing classes he's doing on how to perform the method uh, D648. And he taught us how to, how to do what we do. Say that. Um, and when we were outsourcing our manual validations, I actually helped him create the template that they were using and then they're charging us to use. So then we, we just said, hey, we can we get training on this. So we just so got the training from Marty, a couple a couple of sessions of training to do the mail uh, validations ourselves um, because um, it's another it's another place that we can cut some of our, our overhead for our testing because most of this, this uh, small 
type of testing or oil and gas or um, stationary rice testing is relatively low margin. So we're able to squeeze out some some costs without reducing quality or because it makes us be able to offer our services at a place that makes everybody happy, um, but also meet the entire goal of the client. And the major goal we have is never to cut corners, always to show everything, and we love the board for everything that we do. So that if someone does ever have a question, you don't have to ask anybody that you're looking for. You just look at the report. But if you don't know where to look, it's a call that will walk you through it. This is on a very regular basis with you. Um, any other questions? How is that bad? Is that bad? Is it last year better? Growing <laughs> <laughs> time. They told me I looked dirty. <laughs> I was sitting at the booth <laughs> drinking my coffee. <laughs> there is an FTIR stack testing concepts um, presentation that will be after lunch in this same room done by AMP Cherokee. I don't know if they're going to be using the new Max IR. Um, analyzer to show some examples of these calibration procedures, um, but uh, that may be worth your time. It may be an opportunity to see much of what Robert just talked about uh, done in real life uh, time and, and just getting a better sense of, of what is what's required when you go through the, the data quality objectives of the method. So hope to see you back here at 12, nope, 1, 1 o'clock. Thank you, Robert. This morning. Where were we? Yeah. I was sleeping. That's all we're sitting. I was about showing there. up with a lime yeah. scooter and being like, I don't need a lime scooter. <laughs> Have a little jittery cup of water to hand you. Really? Jittery or water at 6 oh, okay. Maybe we can sit here at 7. Thank you so much. You're, well, okay. Yeah, let's make sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, Tom, did you just get in this room last year? I did not. Okay. Um, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Um, <laughs> so you were Voltaire, and I'm also watching the discussion. I am. Um, <laughs> so it's to fish. Um, and I do have a difference. You probably got to walk. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, if you want to be in here, maybe yeah. twenty five. Yeah, I mean, makes a difference. I mean, it's 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 feel yeah. better. Yeah. It was generally so much better. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I'm not always turned it on for about five minutes and then turned it off. Ask. How's that possible? The original technology. Yeah, how are you making that happen? Come on, like nice try. I'll go grab some lunch. Yeah, you guys have done great. If you want to, do you have a card? Thank you. We'll stay um, I do have somewhere in there. a card at my. Actually, we need to pull some. You guys are at the booth. Yeah, we're right second. across from the registration. But... Oh yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. perfect. Okay, electronic. Everybody's like, I turn it on. Thank you. Where are you based, Kelly? Um, I'm based in California, but okay. we have um, Aura International. So um, we've got laboratories in Brazil, and we have our California location. We're actually expanding over to Portugal and Germany so you guys are going for international. Yeah. Like this is all well cooked. The US is amazing and well cooked and we're rolling it. So that's why yeah. like partnering with like you guys and different things. Guess what? The world is looking at us. Yeah. We set the regs yeah. and now they're like, like, oh, what do they need to do? I'm like, hi, look at the United States. Here mm -hmm. we go. And so we're walking into all these countries going, here's vapor intrusion, here's stack testing, here's all these things. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm leaving. Can I leave? Yeah. You can put it under this table, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, because like uh, like you guys, I had some fun handouts. So because I'm at four o'clock, like good luck trying to get everybody here. Mm -hmm. So um, the happier starting with my talk. So cheers. Yeah. Thank you. Oh.